Jones? Here. Ms. Lewis? Ms. Kara Orange Jones? Here. Mr. Rock? Dr. Thomason? Present. Present. Ms. Vosche? Here. Ms. Hilburn? Here. You have a quorum. What's our first item? Your consent agenda is ready for your approval, adding items 2.2 and 4.1 through 4.5. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, thank you, Ms. Voce, and a second by Dr. Thomason. Is there any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your first item is on page one, item 2.1, consideration of requests from local education agencies for waivers of policy contained in bulletins for the 2018-2019 school year submitted by the State Superintendent of Education. The department recommendation is to approve the waivers for LSBI, Assumption Parish, St. Charles Parish, and Tangipahoe Parish school systems. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Davis. A second by Ms. Edmondson. Do we have any public comment cards on the item? No, ma'am. Superintendent, do you wish to speak? Board members, do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? Do you have any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 20, item 2.3, consideration of the annual approval of alternative education programs and alternative education schools in Louisiana. The department recommendation is to approve. Board members, we need a motion. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Jones. A second by Ms. Voce. Do we have any public comment cards? No, not um, Any questions or comments by board members? Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 26, item 3.1. Consideration of an update report regarding Jumpstart graduation pathways. The department recommendation is to receive the report. Thank you, Ms. Foche. A second by Mr. Garvey. Wait, 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 just a couple of slides. I believe we have a couple of slides on this. And I see Mr. Bradford coming up. Good afternoon, Ken Bradford, Assistant Superintendent, Office of Student Opportunities. Uh, this is a follow-up to, to, to an item that has been on the agenda two times previously. If you may recall, in March, we brought you a snapshot update of where our Jumpstart Career Diploma students were in the process of, of graduation relative to the credentials that they had attained. We then, following March, uh, you asked us to work with an uh, independent consultant third party to validate where the students were relative to their industry-based credential attainment. Uh, in June, I shared with you a, uh, a report that we worked with the Georgetown Center for Workforce Education and a labor market economist uh, that showed that uh, our students who were graduating on that first cohort of, of the Jumpstart Diploma, uh, while they were receiving uh, several more credentials, there appeared that there was a, the report showed that there was a misalignment between the credentials that were being earned and the labor market forecast for the state. So you asked us to bring back to you a framework uh, to address those uh, findings in the report. And what you have here today in your package is, packet is an implementation plan of what the department is, is proposing and what we're proposing to do is to go back to kind of what we did with Jumpstart 1.0 actually when, when Dr. Jones was, was part of that process. And we are going to, we are proposing that between now and January 21st that the department go out, we meet with our stakeholders, we meet with higher education, we meet with business and industry, we meet with workforce development boards, we meet with all of our education stakeholders, and we come back to you with a Jumpstart 2.0 blueprint, will, which will be a, a vision for us for the next three to five years of where we can take Jumpstart and how we can further address the findings in the Labor Market Economist report. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? It's exciting. Ms. Orange Jones? No, that's exciting. Thank you. For... Mr. Davis? I, I'm just delighted that we're moving in this direction. I thank you, Mr. Bradford, for the work you're doing on this. And I know this is taking a little longer than I originally had requested that we would do this, but 
I think the level of work that's going into this is going to be huge for us moving forward. Okay. Any objections, board members? Hearing none, what's our next item? Your next item is on page 29, item 3.2, consideration of Fran Yu as a course provider for the course choice program. The department recommendation is to approve Fran Yu beginning with the 2018-2019 school year. I need a motion. Thank you, Ms. Holloway. Second by Ms. Orange-Jones. I don't have any um, public comment cards on this item. Superintendent, do you have any comments? Board members, do you have comments or questions? Do you have any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 31, item 3.3, consideration of an update report regarding early childhood community network pilots. The department recommendation is to receive the report. I need a motion. Thank you, Ms. Orange-Jones. Second by Ms. Holloway. <clears throat> Can we get our screens, Bessie member screens? Oh, patience, that's what you're asking Thank you. for, isn't it? <laughs> Members, uh, I want to give you an update on legislation passed last uh, <clears throat> session as authored by Representative Stephanie Hilferty. This legislation creates a task force to statewide to study early childhood education, but it also creates a series of community network pilots, which are unified uh, consortia of entities locally who will have significant authority over uh, determinations on early childhood education. Partially, this is designed to solve a number of problems. One of them is there are not enough seats for the families who desire them. Of the seats that exist, too few of them are not yet up to standard. And the lead agencies that exist in every one of your parishes are not really in a position to drive change in either the volume of seats or in the quality of those options that exist. And so, uh, we are asking you, we will be asking you, to uh, authorize a series of pilots according to rules designed by the board. Lessons from these pilots will ultimately, hopefully, inform statewide policy as to how local actors can work with early childhood systems. Thus, we are piloting in a number of, of ways and have put out an RFP to seek local uh, applications for novel local governing structures, how to figure out which programs are in high demand and which are not, how to make decisions with the available money about which programs to grow and which to shrink, which to offer, which not to offer, and how to strategically plan for improving both access that families have as well as the quality of those individual programs. Our objective is that parishes will step up to uh, engage in these activities, which, which heretofore have largely been state-driven activities. The state will contribute support in the form of uh, uh, helping to raise funds, providing guidance, uh, also to distribute resources, to analyze data, and to work with Bessie on determining whether there need to be any waivers of current policies uh, that get in the way of quality pilots. <coughs> Pilot applicants are committing to two years. This school year and the next school year they receive uh, roughly $100,000 over the over that first year and another $100,000 over the second year. And uh, the state will prioritize pilots in areas where there are additional seats available in the 1920 year. So we're, we're, this is just launched. We have an RFI out for local communities to apply and uh, uh, are already receiving significant interest from local communities. Applications were submitted last week, um, and if selected to continue, the uh, revised applicants, meaning those we gave feedback and asked to, to kind of continue with us in the process, will submit to us by mid-November. You will then, and this is the operative point, you will consider the pilots at your December meeting for your approval in terms of who receives the pilot award and what the pilots will be doing. Thank you very much. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? I have a couple of points. So, one, I'm delighted that it's moving forward. This is something that I work with a lot, and, and it's just um, 
it's, it's a great opportunity for us in the state, I think, to take some of the state level knowledge and help push down to the local levels, which is where a lot of this work has to take place. But uh, kind of an idiosyncrasy in looking at this, that we talk about branding and marketing within this for the local ones, but are we, is this initiative, um, do we have anything to kind of branding this one as, this, this program, or is it just the pilot program? Do we have something more substantial than that to work Well, the with? law doesn't, doesn't include a name for it, but I do say, I would say the law gives Bessie the, the imprimatur to design the pilots, and you could imagine Bessie, for example, either requiring a name or developing a name to brand the initiative. I do agree it's a little awkward, it's unbranded. Jessica, would you be the person that I could work with maybe, or if anybody else may want to work with to kind of get that cleared up? That'd be good. Thank you. Anything else, board members? Any objection? I'm hearing none. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 56, item 5.1, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 111, the Louisiana School District and State Accountability System regarding accountability calculations. The department recommendation is to approve as notice of intent revisions to Bulletin 111. I do not see any public comment cards on this item. Superintendent, do you wish to speak? Not on this particular item. Okay. Board members, do you have any comments or questions on this one? Can you repeat the motion, please? Oh, I need to get a motion. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Uh, Ms. Orange-Jones moves and a second by Ms. Holloway. Thank you. You're welcome. Board members, questions or comments? No. Objection from board members? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 61, item 5.2, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 741, Louisiana Handbook for School Administrators regarding STEM diploma endorsements. The department recommendation is to approve as notice of intent revisions to Bulletin 741. We need a motion. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Davis. A second by Mr. Rock. We have some comment cards. Um, these individuals do not wish to speak. Um, Kim Fossey with the Foundation for EBRSS or Generation Ready Louisiana. Uh, Casey Welch with STEM Premier. Again, supports the recommendation, does not wish to speak. Carrie Koch with uh, STEM Premier, supports the recommendation, doesn't wish, wish to speak. And Jen, Jen Kolb um, supports the recommendation. And then another one from Ms. Deborah Moe with LAE. Board members, do you have questions or comments? No. Yes, Ms. Foche. I just have a question. In order to get the endorsement, there would have to be completion of one of these Jumpstart Pathways for STEM. Or, so or, or if, partial completion, yeah. Or partial completion. So you can't get the STEM endorsement if um, you're just strict university pathway. It's only for the Jumpstart pathways that we've designated? Well, no, because th those courses now count toward a diploma, even if it's the university diploma, because they have equivalents. This was part of the uh, package that was voted on jointly with the Board of Regents to give some of those courses an equivalent in the TOPS core. So these courses can qualify for the TOPS core uh, as equivalents to some of the current, more traditional math and science courses. But it's within these pathways? <coughs> yes, it is. Yes, okay. It is. Yes. So there's the traditional pathway you wouldn't be able That's to get right. this yeah, STEM right. endorsement right. at all. Yeah. Unless you took the STEM, STEM courses as electives. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Are there any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 63, item 5.3, consideration of revisions to bulletins regarding alternative education programs, schools, and accountability. Revised backup documentation for bulletin 111, notice of intent, and emergency rule has been distributed. The department recommendation is to approve as notices of intent, revisions to bulletin 111 and 131. Approve as notice of intent and emergency rule, the revisions to bulletin 111, section 605. And approve the repeal in bulletin 741 of sections 2901, 2903, 2905, and 2909. So moved. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Second. And a second by Ms. Foche. Yes, Superintendent White, you can start, and then I have a handful of comment cards here. Thank you. 
Members, uh, this is multiple bulletins being changed within one item as a package. And let me just describe for a second, uh, and this language that I'm going to pull from is in the executive recommendation. Uh, you'll recall that this effort comes out of a report that you received more than a year ago related to the status of alternative schools. It has been processed through a number of different working groups, some convened by Bessie, some convened by the legislature. It's then been, there was a specific working group of Bessie members established to kind of oversee this department's development of various procedures. When that was wrapped up, we began bringing policy to the special ed advisory panel, to the accountability commission, and to the superintendent's advisory council. So it's been much vetted. This package does uh, a number of things. First, it changes the uh, requirements as to what alternative schools are supposed to do to bring them in line with the law. Second, it changes the requirements for how uh, alternative schools and programs are approved by the state to bring that in line with the law. Third, it changes the formula by which these schools are rated, receiving letter grades and school performance scores. And fourth, one piece of that is it changes the number of students required to be in a school in order for a school to receive a letter grade. That is the piece that is going into effect of this immediately as it affects letter grades this fall, which I, I raised because uh, Ms. Lewis and I were in a discussion about this, this earlier. Happy to discuss uh, any one of those pieces, but I wanted to outline them for you because they all kind of work together. In other words, the requirements for the programs and schools are changing, which necessitates that the approval process change, which necessitate that the rating formula change, and all of those are kind of uh, wrapped into one uh, process. Certainly look forward to comments and questions. So we have a, um, a number of comment cards, Superintendent. Can you, you said it changes what the schools do. Give us a little background on what that means. Well, the, the law is very prescriptive as to the type of support services, for example, that alternative schools are to provide. Uh, fair to say that the report that was released more than a year, year ago indicated that sometimes those services are, are not being provided, in fact, quite often. And second, that there are times when our bulletins are, are out of line with the law and are not specifically requiring certain things. Well, then you've got to look at the bullet that outlines, well, when the state gets an application from a local school system, are we evaluating schools on that basis as contemplated in the law? And the answer there was largely no. So we're trying to bring that into line. So we're trying to line up what's required, say, you know, mental health services, for example, what's required in terms of the advising and counseling of students uh, related to that issue with the approval of programs, with the way that those programs are held accountable. And that's what you see uh, in front of you today. Okay. Board members, I'm going to go ahead and um, get public comment unless you have any pressing questions. Okay. And then I will ask, because we, we do have a handful, I'm going to ask those who make comments to stay towards the front. And if you could just note any questions that you may have for individuals, and we'll call people back up to the mic as appropriate. I do have a couple of people who um, support the recommendation but do not wish to speak. To speak, That would be Deborah Moe with LAE and then Anne Catherine Lene with JCFA. Both support but do not wish to speak. Um, in support but wishes to speak is Millie Harris with JCFA. Um, Sean Fleming is here to provide information for us. He's with the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council. Uh, Rana Atala is here with the Urban, Urban League of Louisiana. And then Erica uh, McConduit with the Education Trust of Louisiana. So if you'll all come up. And I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and let the audience know that um, my son and a couple of his classmates got off early today and are in the audience and they had been sitting in the back. Oh, they're off to the side here, boys, you can wave. Um, they're not skipping school. School was dismissed early. Uh, they had been sitting in the back, but I wanted them to come out and hear this particular argument, especially because I understand we have people on, on different sides of it. So. 
All right, Ms. Harris, let's hear Thank from you. Thank you so much, Bessie. I'm delighted to be here today. I feel like this, for us, has been a nine-year journey. I remember my first outreach to Jim Garvey regarding accountability came when we looked at the fact that more than 30% of our graduates were graduating in fifth, sixth, or seventh year. And us speaking with Jim about the current accountability system and ensuring that those students who are persisting and graduating high school, despite the fact that they're not in a four-year cohort, should be counted. And for the last eight years, we have done good work in Jefferson Parish, Orleans, and now in Lafayette and those surrounding districts to support students who need a non-traditional pathway to the high school diploma. And I am pleased to tell you that just last month, one of our very first students who came to us as a fourth year junior back in 2010 earned his high school diploma just last month. So persistence pays off, and I believe that your persistence in finding an alternative rubric to celebrate the work of alternative schools is starting on a path where we will see a true accountability system that supports alternative education. So I absolutely appreciate and support this. One area that both the NET and JCFA have a concern with, and we've spoken with the DOE, and they are working on helping us understand it a little more, and the DOE has a great, done a great job in this effort, is the core credit attainment. It focuses primarily on the courses earned in math, science, social studies, and English. And we know that in many alternative programs, students aren't earning these core courses, so we believe that it is important. But I want you to consider this. If a student is a Jump Start student, and they are taking NCCER in their first semester, JAG in their first semester, and then transitions to math in their first semester. And they earn all of those credits. They would have earned no core credits in their first semester. In the second semester, they take English one, Algebra one, and Carpentry one. They would have only earned two core course credits over the course of the year, and the school would have earned a very little um, very little points in the course credit portion of this SPS. So we think that this is a good place to start. We know that as models are run and actual data is input that there will be hopefully some considerations and some validations in data, but it is something that we need to continue to look at specifically with those Jumpstart Pathway students because they may not in one academic year have those four core courses if they're behind, if we're giving them a reading course before they're given English one, that reading class is not going to count as a core credit, yeah. even though that student may need it. If they're taking multiple courses outside, JAG, any of the NCCR, carpentry, welding, those aren't going to count as core courses, even though if they're on a jumpstart diploma pathway, those are absolutely core courses required for their graduation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fleming? Good afternoon. Um, Madam Chair, your son's been very, very well behaved, didn't know he was yours. Good job. Thank you. Um, I'm Sean Fleming with, I'm with Louisiana Development Disabilities Council. I have a few points. The first of which, um, I, I do not agree that uh, this has been fully vetted by stakeholders, particularly the people who are most vested and in, involved, and I'm speaking of parents of children with developmental disabilities or disabilities in general. Um, I went to two presentations on this. I went to the Accountability Commission. I went to the Special Education Advisory Panel. Um, the Special Ed Education Advisory Panel did not endorse. They just received the report. There were three members on that panel who actually drove into the Accountability Commission to raise objections to it. And I found it uh, striking that that Special Education Advisory Panel considered 26, 27 percent of people in alternative schools and programs have disabilities were not asked their opinion on it. I also found that the information provided um, was, was strange. And, and you're going to hear people talk about the change in um, number of students, but there's no change in number of students required for an account school accountability score. It's testing units <coughs> or graduation cohorts uh, units. Um, and I never heard until this morning or, or actually this afternoon, thankfully y'all went long enough for me to hear information before this was heard, and I just heard just now from Superintendent White that this is an emergency rule and it's going to go into effect for scores next month. The, um, Every Student Succeeds Act requires stakeholder input, so I'll just go back to point number one. 
Um, I find it odd that last August the state submitted a plan for ESSA on its school accountability score and now we're going to change it by emergency rule and I don't think people fully understood what was even being decided on and the stakeholders, that is parents, were not necessarily given a, an opportunity to weigh in. Personally, I do think some of the measures are better measures for students. I also have concerns that we're going to have a separate accountability system and the message that we'll send, you have uh, 34, I believe, alternative schools and 136 somewhat alternative programs. And there are more kids in alternative programs than schools. In most school systems, they do not have schools. The concern is they will be encouraged to shift a program to a school, and based on the units, they could possibly avoid having a school performance score by not giving kids access, which is the exact opposite of what you want. By not giving a kid a test, they can actually reduce the probability of them getting a score. Um, I, the, the bottom line is I think you ought to give it pause. The fact that it's going to emergency rule was striking to me. I think there are criteria. I don't have them on top of my head, and I apologize for not being able to pull that up fast enough. But there's criteria required for an emergency rule to go into effect, and I believe that would be challenged. I, I do urge y'all to, to pause on this and, and allow stakeholders, parents of kids with disabilities in particular, to weigh in and just speak to it. I, I thought her comments were great because even though some of the elements we see are good, or possibly good, um, there still seems to be some things, even people serving kids with disabilities or, or serving kids in those uh, settings would prefer be tweaked. I don't think adequate time has been provided to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Atala? Good evening. Raina Atala, Urban League of Louisiana. To be honest, I don't know where to start. We worked very hard on the ESSA plan, and we were very proud that we have an N size of N for accountability and N for report and 10 for reporting. So I'm looking at the report that came about alternative schools. We're not in a good place. We're in a horrible place. But if we're trying to change things, we have to take our time to making a change and we have to be careful not to push for unintended consequences while we're trying to make a positive change. I would say that Item one and item three of the proposal are amazing. You're given a different chance for those kids to, to succeed because kids, students come to um, learning or they have different challenges that they don't come to the same outcome at the same time as others. But I don't see a reason that with all these supports that's gonna be in place, financial, um, behavior, academic, all these supports that we're trying to put in place to turn those schools around, we need to give it a chance to, to succeed. The stimulation says that 65% of the schools will be C or above if we give it enough chance for these changes to take place, the new accountability measures, the new supports in place. So why the rush to change the end size, the end number, if this means we have to change it for the whole state? If you change the end size for one, for whatever reason, you have to change it for the, for the whole state, for the whole plan. We did not even have one year of ESSA. Since, we've, since it was proposed, since it was accepted, give the plan a chance to succeed. The biggest warning that we heard when our ESSA plan passed is be careful when implementation hits because that's the time when people start changing things. That's not what we bought into. We worked very hard with the Department of Ed to propose an ESSA plan that we are proud of. If we start on the first conjunction changing things and tweaking things without taking the time to include stakeholder input, then we're, we're, we're hurting our state more than we're helping. We are at a, at a point that we want to change and push reform. We have a good plan. If we start changing it so that our scores look better, that's not a good start. And I agree with Mr. Fleming. If we push for this to happen immediately, how do we apply new changes to the years past? You, you, you put a plan in place, you try it, and then after you try it, you apply the changes. But you don't apply a change, like whatever is trying to happen right now, it shouldn't apply for last year. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica McConduit. I am here on behalf of the Education Trust. 
um, representing a number of organizations who signed on to a letter that you should have all received, essentially, in effect, um, echoing what you've heard from my colleagues, that we just do not feel like there is a reason to change the end size. And I just want to be specific because there are other pieces of the proposal that, you know, in, in fairness, may have merit. In full disclosure, I was part of the working group that wa worked on alternative education. So I sat around the tables, had many of these debates, and quite frankly, you know, do support some of what is, is contained in the recommendations. Our working group never touched end size. That is not something that was proposed as a result of the work that we did in the working group. Um, and as you heard today, it is particularly disturbing that for most of the organizations that have opposed this shift in end size, we were deeply engaged with the formation of the plan. We were provided an opportunity to work alongside the department on things that really mattered, particularly those matters of equity, and ensuring that every school was going to be held accountable for providing a quality education for all students. When we start shifting things in alternative education, we have to also be careful in terms of, of, of who we are touching um, and who's represented in those schools. They are overwhelmingly disproportionately represented <coughs> by African American students, African American boys, and students with disabilities. And so there, there is definitely a potential for some unintended consequences. There, the other pieces of this proposal may actually work to rectify some of what we are trying, attempting to fix. Give it an opportunity. There, I have not heard yet a real articulation for why the need to change the end size. So the shift in the uh, accountability framework as predicted through simulations of the department, will already move the majority of alternative schools from a failing status. Let us give that an opportunity to take effect before we jump the gun and start making unnecessary changes without the, the adequate and the requisite stakeholder engagement that is required by ESSA, that we did previously have an opportunity to participate in. So I am speaking on behalf of the Urban League, the Louisiana Association of Business and Industry, Louisiana Federation for Children, Equity in All Places, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Our Voice, Nuestra Voz, Louisiana Parent Training and Information Center, the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council, Teach for America, and 100 Black Men of Metro New Orleans. This is a very diverse coalition of stakeholders, obviously representing the interests of many constituents across this state. For, for there to be alignment and consensus that we, number one, are asking you guys to not move forward with the change in the end size, to give us an opportunity to have the, to have the, the, the requisite stakeholder engagement that we have previously uh, been accustomed to in working alongside the department. We have been really strong advocates trying to, to fight to protect the rights of all students and ensure that educators and systems are held accountable for all of our students in New Orleans. We have been good in Louisiana. We have been very strong partners. Um, and we are asking for the opportunity to continue to do that. To do that. Number one, don't change the end size. We have not heard that it is absolutely necessary. Number two, give some of the recommendations that you have already put forward an opportunity to have effect, um, to see if there's even a need to change anything beyond that. And number three, at the very least, don't decide on something that will be implemented immediately. Give us an defer this item and give us an opportunity to continue to work with, with the department and others, advocates, parents, you know, school leaders, the like, to come to some solutions. I've spoken to some other national um, organizations that said there are options available. There could be a very narrowly tailored waiver that restricts eligibility so that some of what you're perhaps trying to solve can be solved another way rather than shifting the end size, which sends a very poor message from our state that you are backing away from holding all schools accountable for providing a high quality education for every student in this state. So again, again, I ask you, do not shift the end size. Give some of the other proposals an opportunity to be implemented and to take effect, and at the very least, give an opportunity by deferring for us to, to work on this. Thank you. Thank you. We also How many more speakers do we have? We have two more speakers. Can we get through two more speakers yeah, and then I can I'd like to remind 
these speakers that if you could stay close, that would be helpful. Okay. And first row would be best. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. <laughs> We have uh, Danny Garrett, who both supports and opposes this recommendation, but now he's waving at us. Okay, well, are you going to speak or not? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth Ostberg from the Net Charter School. Okay, she had to go. She does support the recommendation, though. All right, well, Mr. Garvey, sorry about that. You can, uh, which, which so person would you like to call to back up? Back down. And do you need to speak to all of them? I don't, but I'm not really sure which ones would be the best to address, but I think Ms. Ms. Conduit and uh, Ms. Harris, um, who called me out um, and pointed out something that I wanted to point out in a little more detail to the Bessie members here. I was one of the earliest, uh, I may not have been the earliest, because I think Dr. Jones may have been the <laughs> earliest proponent of doing something to make sure that the schools that are teaching a very unusual set of students get recognized for the efforts and the progress that they're making. Uh, Ms. Harris's school has done a tremendous job um, with the particularly difficult students that they have. I don't think that the proposal that we have on the table today is nearly as good as what we could get for a proposal if we waited just a little bit um, and worked on it just a little bit more. I have fought, I would say, a lot of fights against people who have come to the table and argued for delay. Delay, delay, you've heard me, I think, uh, those who have been around, argue against delay. And I would point out that that has almost always, if not always been, when the delay is coming from groups that really have no firm intention of trying to get something put in place and passed that would improve things. It, it was always delay for delay's sake. I think you heard these people say they don't want to delay for delay's sake. They want to delay to get something really good done, and they think we are very, very close. I would hate to rush what could be something really fantastic when we could be maybe six months or eight months away from getting something <clears throat> really great done. Uh, I would hate to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, but I would also hate to let a few months mess us up. If this was going to be something that I thought would be several years down the road before we could get to something really acceptable to Bessie members and eight different statewide groups that were pointed out and probably more than those, uh, I would not be in favor of it. But I think that as I said, we are close, uh, not years away, but months away. And at the very least, what I would hate to do is put in rules today that would affect, as Ms. Conduit says, the results from the tests that were taking, that, were ta that had been taken this past spring. I don't think applying rules retroactively like that is a way for us to go, particularly when there are so many questions on the table that are unanswered. Thank you. So you didn't really have any questions for I people. wasn't sure. You just, okay, I thanks. Can create a no, 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 that was audience. not my intent. And my answer is yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Davis, you look like you want to speak. Yeah, yeah. I, oh, I just want a clarification, um, and forgive my ignorance on this, but are we looking at, I was under the impression that this was to change the insides for the alternative framework from 10 to 30, but is this changing our entire framework in size from 10 to 30? 30, yes. 10, no. 10 to 30. 10 to 30. Yes. Everything, not just alternatives. See, there's, I'm seeing heads head nodding different stories. Well, can you restate your question, Mr. Davis, for uh, the, Superintendent White? The, the proposed change from an in size of 10 to 30, is that simply for, or, or um, just for the alternative framework accountability, or is that for Louisiana State accountability. 
It's it's one and the same because only alternative schools are as small as having 10 students or 20 students in them. Um, so technically, yes, it is every school, but the only schools in the state that only have 10, 12, 15, 20 kids in them are alternative schools. Let's talk about this first for a second. What we're, what, we're, what are we talking Good about idea. here? What happened? Um, there was a working group formed that of Bessie members, and one of the things that group raised is the concern that you have very, very small schools of 10, 15, 20 students, many of them explicitly designed to serve <laughs> residential populations, and some of them just simply tiny uh, alternative environments in rural areas that are very small. And what was raised for us is how can you validly measure such a small setting year in and year out when you have variations that go from, say, 13 kids to 15 kids? You know, well, that has a huge impact on the letter grade um, when, in fact, it's actually a relatively small change in the aggregate. And so uh, working with the working group at Bessie, the proposal was, well, let's change the end size. Let's see what the, what the impact of that is. And the impact is that it, it, uh, there are 15 schools in a system of 1,500. There are 15 schools that serve 0. .0004 of the state's population that would, that used to receive a letter grade that wouldn't. Um, the majority of the students that are counted are in residential settings. And the majority of those students in residential settings have uh, very significant cognitive disabilities. You can argue that policy issue one way or the other. Uh, but that was the decision of the, of the, the group and the guidance that we, that we received. What it is not and what it has been incorrectly, I, think, I don't think with any intention, but incorrectly portrayed as, is equivalent to subgroup end size or reporting end size. <coughs> Those are the much more prominent public policy issues that groups like the Education Trust have previously advocated for nationally, rightly. Meaning, if in any of those schools you have 10 students with disabilities, you have 10 students who are English learners, you have 10 low-income students, 10 native students, whatever it is, that still gets called out. That still gets reported. And that is still subject to the urgent intervention label under ESSA. The only thing that's changed is that 0.0004% of the stu excuse me, students in the state no longer are in a center that has a letter grade. Subgroups, ESSA intervention, Title I funding, any of that stuff doesn't change. I'm sorry, I have a question. Dr. Jones. And I want to I want to emphasize that again. That's four ten thousandths of the students that would be impacted by this. That's fifteen schools out of fifteen hundred. And Mr. <coughs> Mr. Fleming. Don't, don't raise your hand because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here I know is going to offend you. But you're a state employee. You're some, not supposed to advocate a position. You're supposed to present, pre present information. And what concerns me here is that we've been dealing with this issue since 2004 in my and Ms. Voce's experience. And we've advocated for special consideration for these kids that don't have a normal distribution of scores. And for those teachers that come to work in a school system that gets an F every day because they have no way to get out of that hole. Now, I believe that Louisiana can survive with 99.9999% of the students in the accountability system without that 0.0004% being a negative impact on the system as a whole. We're talking about 15 schools out of 1,500. <coughs> We're talking about four ten thousandths of the students that are there, and these are all students with significant cognitive disabilities or, or reasons that schools struggle to provide the, the, the education for those kids. And it, to me, it's just not fair for a situation like that for a, a teacher to come to school every day knowing that there's going to be an F stuck on them and there's nothing they can do about it. Thank you. Ms. Voce? Okay. And um, to echo Dr. Jones, you know, we have been talking about this same issue for years and years, even before 2004, before Superintendent White, 
before superintendent pastor. Uh, the first year superintendent pastor came in, he promised all of us the change in the alternative school accountability. So we're not talking on a whim or talking of something that just came up and poof, we made a change. This has been years and years in the making. Now the in size provision, as Superintendent White has said, any school, alternative school, any of these things that we're talking about, if there are 10 kids in any subgroup, that subgroup will get a school performance score. And that school performance score will determine, uh, I say a school performance, a subgroup performance score, which is the SPS. And that school will be subject to whatever interventions are outlined in ESSA, the urgent intervention required and then the urgent, in, urgent intervention needed and then required. So if there are 10 students with disabilities in a school, any school, including the ones we're talking about here, or 10 students in any subgroup, and that school is failing those kids, they do have the same sanctions. This subgroup, or this NSI, like Ms. Harris's school, your alternative charter school will get an overall grade. You have more than 30 kids. I have an alternative school in my parish. It has more than 30. I'll still get a school performance score. So I'm not arguing from a personal standpoint here with my school system. But there are some schools in this state that only have 10 or 20 kids in it. And we're talking about giving them a whole school label. If their whole school is comprised of just that subgroup, those 10 kids are in that same subgroup, they're still going to get the equivalent of that SPS will be calculated for those 10 kids and that they will get a subgroup score. So I don't, I, I don't see where this is a bad thing. We're still holding accountable. We're not changing the end size to 30 for a subgroup. We're changing the end size, if we do this, to 30 for an entire school. And the scores of all of these kids, kids, regardless of the size of the school, will go into the district score. It's still going to be accountable. <coughs> so I, I really think that this is a step in a positive direction because subgroups are still protected. They are still protected because that score is still calculated for them according to what we've been told if this policy passes. So we're looking at an overall school score for a school that might have 20 kids. And when we put that in the context of the entire state, if a school has only 20 kids, I even question if it should be, uh, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess classified as a school. But that's a whole different discussion. But those scores are still in the district scores. They don't get eliminated from the district scores. And the scores are still calculated if the end size is 10 in a specific subgroup. The other changes to the accountability formula for alternative schools that we're talking about are the ones we've talked about for years that should be there. Alternative schools are getting kids who are historically behind, kids that have extraordinary academic challenges. And what we're looking at is a model that's going to see how that alternative school moves that child. The majority of the child's score is going to be on growth and the attainment of credentials and exit documents and diplomas, which is what we need to be doing in an alternative setting. So I think these are some very positive changes. While if I had to rewrite these bulletins, I would change a little bit here, a little bit there. But that's the whole purpose of all these working groups that were set up. The ones that were referred to that uh, these ladies were on, I was on another one. There were several different working groups that all have come together with, you know, these particular recommendations came from multiple sources. So when you look at it holistically, it is a, I feel, it is a good thing for alternative schools. It is a good thing for students. And remember, 
when we're putting this label on it, you know, I'm, we're not putting a label on, on the child, as I'm told all the time. It's on the school and what they're doing with those children. And if that school has a subgroup of 10 kids in that same subgroup, they're going to get that overall score and will still be subject to all the interventions that are necessary according to the ESSA plan. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lewis and then Ms. Orange-Jones. I just want to preface my statements. Gary and Doris, I'm definitely in support of this. We have been talking about this, and I'm glad we moving in that direction. Um, but my only concern is the timing with the emergency rule, the retroactive of these grades that's coming out November 8th in two weeks. Um, so I guess I would like to offer up like a substitute motion if we maybe you can implement that for next school year and not this school year because I just think we have too many changes and too many moving parts and it's just gonna be massive confusion with Jessica and her team with accountability and just a variety of things. I just think maybe we just need to make it an effective date for next school year. I just wanted to make sure that you understood that only Bulletin 111, Section 605 is an emergency rule. The others are not. I just wanted to make that clear for everyone. So what, is what is that? Is that the timing for the new? What is so let's go to page 87. It's in your handout. Okay, it's in the handout. Please give us some clarification on this. I can't explain the, the rationale by why this is needed. I, I just wanted to clarify that um, that would have to be the department. But I just wanted to clarify that it's not all of those policies, that it's emergency rule, just 605. So the 605 talk about the, the SPS scores for this year? So we have two handouts that have bulletin 111 and 605 on it. Okay, so we look, which one? The emergency rule is Okay, <laughs> all right, so. So where are we? All right, so the emergency rule, if you look at, um, if you look at the top of the page and then you have ER in parentheses at the top, so members, it's this small portion. This is the piece that would be emergency rule. That's the single page handout. Yes. That is the single page, thank you. Is okay. So the stapled page is not the emergency rule, it's the single page that's emergency rule. Okay. Did you guys get that clear? Okay. Gary just Question. handed it to me, I didn't have it before. Okay. Dr. Boffy. Ms. Edmondson, let me yes. make sure that Ms. Lewis, and then I also had Ms. Orange Jones up um, okay. on the issues. So, Ms. Lewis, you have. Um, That's still not clear to me. Like, where okay. does it say so retroactively for 2017 2018 grades? <laughs> they won't be reported. Like, where's that on? Do here? you have a question for the superintendent? I do. Ms. Lewis? I guess it's a question for the superintendent. It's a question for Jessica. I mean, where, this, where this, is this, this modification? Was not saved for last year. We're, we're about, the works we were making for last year. This is the only one. This is, this is a Sobito rule. Oh, this will be the rule. So what are we doing for this year? That's my question. Superintendent. Okay, we're going to let the superintendent answer. The only uh, piece that is uh, in emergency rule is uh, the part of Bulletin 111 that changes the size of the number of students required to generate a school performance score, which is the piece that was just discussed. And the recommendation is for that to be an emergency rule because there is an impending event. Um, there is an impending emergency, which is effectively that, that if you want this policy, the department is about to award letter grades that would then be inappropriately awarded were this policy not emergency rule. That's why it's emergency rule. Uh, we are doing that because our, our sense of, of the board's will has been to move in that direction. If the board doesn't want to move in that direction and wants to take more time and implement this in years hence, then that's the board's direction. Well, I don't know what the board's direction is, but I get angst about changing something two weeks ahead of a major educational policy event that this board is responsible for. So I would like to modify to get rid of the emergency rule and maybe just put an implementation for that in size to be 
use for those calculations next year and keep everything as it is this year. I don't know how to communicate that, but that's just my opinion. I don't know what the, whatever the board. Well, the way you would communicate it would be in the form of a motion and it would need a second. Yeah. We probably want to discuss. Okay, we saying. won't go to the motion. If I might suggest, Ms. Lewis, if we could maybe finish the discussion around yeah. this issue and what, and then as we get to the end, if we still feel that we need to change, yeah. make that change, we'll do it that way. That way we're not confusing the conversation at hand. Oh, I thought you were finished. No, I think there's still several hands out there for this yes. discussion. Yes, Miss Orange Jones was next, oh, and then Miss okay. Edmonston. Miss Orange Jones. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to track. Okay, so we're going to hold on your motion, I'm substitute motion. for a second. Um, I think that so the issue, the issue that I've, a lot of the issues that I've heard that have been that have been addressed were about kind of the impact of this increase on subgroups. I feel like we've had conversation about that. Not subgroups, but, but SPS. SPS, SPS, excuse me. Um, can you just speak to wh where in implementation this could get dicey, if at all, from your standpoint? It's really, uh, there is no real implementation. I mean, you're, you're going to do the same calculations we would ever, ever do. It's just a question of whether you publish it on a, okay. on a website. Okay. So you either put up a letter grade or you don't for these 15 sites for the what Gary said, four ten thousandths of the kids. That's, that, that's, that's, that's the, the only, only, that's the only distinction. Thing. Okay. The rest of the implementation is related to subgroups, which you're still going to act on. Title I, which you're still going to act on, um, and, and all yeah. of that. But, but again, I, I want to I emphasize that um, <laughs> this, this has been with strong board leadership. And I think a sense from many, many discussions with board members as we went through this process on alternative schools that there were a number of, and, and just to take this back, remember the whole alternative framework issue that this board has dealt with with charter schools. Then remember when the superintendent of Rapids came and he said, I've got a tiny hospital that is called a school. It's not a school, is what he said. It is a, it is a healthcare facility that happens to service kids between the ages of five and 20 or what, whatever it is. Educationally. You know, that's what prompted the discussion yeah, among right. board members to say, we need a more accurate definition of what a school is. The concern that, that you know, our colleagues at the Education Trust are raising is right if you didn't have any ability to intervene. But what, what the board has said is, no, we don't want you to not be able to intervene. You need to be able to intervene. If there are students with disabilities or English learners or what have you that aren't learning, you need to be able to intervene. It's just that the board has said, we don't think it's a valid thing to put a letter grade on a school that has 12 kids. Understood. And those are different things. Understood. And so I don't really think there's an implementation change. It's really just a matter of do you put a letter grade on a website or not. That's the only change. Thank you. Ms. Edmonston, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, Superintendent, why? I, I would just like for you to, once again, I know you've done this before, but for the record, explain why emergency room. Well, again, I'm, 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 so, I'm working with the board here. Right. Um, I think that my strong sense from the board was that there was a feeling that this is a situation that, that needs to be rectified and that it can be rectified and that going through another cycle of awarding a letter grade based on something that the majority of the board members don't want <coughs> awarded would be problematic. It would be injurious. There's no reason to cause harm when you can see the harm being caused. So why not stop it, put it in place immediately, and not make the department put up that letter grade on the website? That's, that, that's why. In other words, in a month, we're going to put up letter grades. Why would we do that when the board has told us they don't want us to do it? Well, can I, can I answer that? I, I, I was on the Bessie working group, and I don't remember us really talking about that you know, specifically. But I do wonder about, you know, we were talking about setting precedent earlier. I do wonder if we would pass the emergency rule for this for something that's already been done. I, I, I just I, I have a funny feeling about that, I, and, and I just, from my viewpoint, I don't think that's a good thing for us to do. But I do understand what you're saying, and I'm being on the working group, I know what we were asking for, and I think we're moving forward, but I, I do have a problem with that. Um, Dr. Jones? I, I hate to keep coming back to the well here, but 
of it. The emergency rule part is the least concerning thing of this whole thing to me. Mm -hmm. Getting the, the problem fixed that's been there for over 20 years is, is what's important to me. So if you want to stick another F up there on, on, on 15 schools for another year uh, just to, to satisfy the, the, the fact that it's, it's, it's post hoc, it's already happened for this year, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem with is delaying the solution of the thing and getting it done. So if it, if it satisfies the board to, 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 to give those 15 schools an F for another year, fine. But I, I, I would like to see the issue resolved today. I think we've come to that point, and I think it's time for us to do that. Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Davis had asked, and then we'll go to you, Ms. Kara Orange-Jones. Uh, changing uh, a different issue that I have. Um, uh, not an issue, just a question or a clarification. On, on Section 605, the, the, the part that we're looking at for emergency ruling, on letter E, that's written pretty uh, plainly, but just to make sure I understand, since the number is expected to stay approximately the same, the number of schools that will be affected by this, this is written in a way that says that if that increases, that if a new, that if an LEA, a district, has a new school, they have to explain that to us, written justification of why they have a new school. Mm -hmm. But we have at our option then, the ability to say they fall under this framework as we've declared or not. Is that correct? So that would be a vote of this board to say we uh, move to move it under the system or not under the system. So we would take that moving forward. That's just to be clear with the board and, and the superintendent. I'm on the right page with that? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So the, back to the percentage of 0. .0004, that number is what we're expecting to remain somewhat constant. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm picking on that number, but that's what we're referring to. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. Just a, I yes, Ms. Orange -Jones. a rich conversation and, and a lot has been um, brought brought to the surface in it and I just wanted to see whether or not Ms. McConnell, you actually wanted to respond. Not meant to be I back did. and forth, but Thank curious. You. Thank you, um, because a lot has been referred to the Education Trust, and I just want to be clear that yes, the Education Trust alongside the, Urban, the National Urban League and many national civil rights organizations is deeply committed to protecting subgroups and so yes the, the identification staying at the end size of 10 and the reporting end size staying at 10 is important but all of those groups including Ed Trust are equally concerned about accountability um, and so that is where we want to see it also remain at 10. I just want to flag a few things here. Number one is that part of what you are moving forward in this proposal through the department's own simulations will not in effect continue to label this small group of schools with an F. 67% will automatically move to a C or better. Okay, so that, that's number one, is that it's not give the new part of this framework time to take effect because you may already solve the issue that you are attempting to solve for in shifting the end size. That's number one. Number two is that, I, again, I just want to say there are other options. I agree with you. There has to be some other way to address this issue. And there are that don't involve changing the end size. There could be a very narrowly tailored waiver that limits eligibility to get to the same end. I do not disagree with you. Again, I participated on an alternative education working group. Something has to be done differently. And part of what you are doing is already going to address that. For whatever small percentage remains beyond that, perhaps we could consider, if you would give us time to simply consider whether another option, other than shifting the end size, is possible. That's all we're simply saying is that we have, we have been good partners to the department. Give us some time to work with, with the department and national experts to come up with a solution to address that small gap beyond the 67% that will already be adjusted with the framework that you are likely to move forward. Madam Chairman. Um, yes, Mr. Garvey. Okay, uh, we have heard several people say that we've been working on this either since 2004 or for 20 years. Uh, that is a long time. Uh, and the superintendent said that the, the working group has been working for this on this for, I think, over a year. Uh, can I ask you, when was it that you heard that the proposal is to change uh, the grading system retroactively? 
retro today, um, today, in terms of the retroactive. So it was not months ago. No, no, no. It was not 20 uh, what, years what, ago. And I just heard about the shift in the end size through the um, presentation at the Accountability Commission. Which so, was so, how which long was ago? September, September nineteenth, I believe. One that month meeting. ago, less than one month, month ago. Than, so we we have not had and a, a real substantive point. We opportunity. Have been working on this for a long time. Everybody agrees on that. I agree on that. The delay, if we're talking about a delay, is not a delay that's going to take another twenty years or another two thousand and four to now, however many that is. We're talking about a couple of months. Let me ask you. You mentioned that. Uh, you could come up with some proposals that might work around the problem with the proposal that's here today that would be retroactively applied. Do you think you could have those proposals at least in a draft form by the December meeting of Bessie? Yeah, I think you already have one that the department through its own simulation says will address 67 percent of the schools. It will shift them to a C or better based on their, their simulation. So you're more than half the way there and in addressing the issue. In with addition what, to that, do you think yes, you bring some more to the this, table by the December meeting? Absolutely. Just okay. give I would us like to offer a substitute motion that we delay, that we defer this issue until the December Bessie meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, just to, to clarify, do you mean defer the entire thing or defer the issue the of the, the entire thing? The entire thing. Two months. Why the entire uh, thing? Can you speak to why the because entire Because the, the only way to not have this no, uh, yeah. go into effect retroactively for last year's testing is to defer the whole thing and not just the end size. If you defer just on the end size, just the emergency ruling, then the rest of it will apply retroactively to the tests that were taken in the spring of this year. Okay. Would it not so be you need a second. I didn't get, I didn't see the second. Thank you for the clarity on that. So we have a motion from Mr. Garvey, a second from Ms. Lewis to defer this um, entire item until the December meeting. Board members, would you like to discuss this new development? A, a question for cover on the, on the process here is that uh, would it not be to, to uh, to satisfy Mr. Garvey's intent, would it, I think, would it not be possible to simply remove the notice of intent piece uh, from the wording of this as we have the original motion? Do you mean the emergency rule piece? Correct. Yeah. I, so my question, it would be I, possible I think, to remove just did, that. I think Mr. Garvey has to answer that question. It would not question. remove the retroactivity part of the proposal. Yeah. I see. It, it would just... But isn't that one the same at this point? The, idea, the retroactivity piece, the notice of intent has to go in for the retroactive to go for this last year. Right. So if we didn't have the notice of intent going in right now, it wouldn't apply for last year. Is that my misunderstanding? about the emergency? Ms. Davis, right. would you like to come to the microphone? <laughs> I think one solves the other issue, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. That's the issue, really. Uh, so if the other system. notice of intent gets approved, it'll take the thir three months to be active. So if you remove the emergency rule, piece is still going, it's not going to be retroactive for this year. It will take effect roughly in three months. If the new no, grading system applying to the alternative schools that, would not be affecting the grades that will be released in two weeks? Not That's if, right. unless it's right. an emergency That's right. rule. It has to be emergency rule for it so, to be. So we could, Mr. Garvey, then, if we like the other pieces, move forward without that notice of intent, and it would solve that issue, just yeah. to point that out there. Without the emergency rule. Well, yeah. let me ask the question. If Then what would the other notices of intent that are not emergency rules accomplish with regard to the grades that will be released in November of this year, in two weeks? It would no, not apply. It would not affect that in any way. There would be, it would not apply to the grades um, in November of this year, what would happen is that it would apply for these alternative schools to the grades next, next November, year next year. Okay. Can you amend? Yeah, I, I would amend my motion to that effect. <laughs> so Mr. Garvey has amended his substitute motion to remove, and, and essentially what we're saying is that you make a motion to support these items that were presented to us Absent the emergency rule. Yes. As notices of intent, no emergency rule. Seconded by Miss Lewis, who I'm I think we need to get some I'm only seconding if I get clarification that 
the letter grades and everything this year is going to stay the same, but the next year. That's correct. Who do you want that clarification that from, Ms. Lewis? Um, I guess Shan or the superintendent. I think Shan gave it to us already. So the superintendent, would you like to reiterate what Shan right. said? As always, I'm with Shan. <laughs> well, then I can go ahead on and second that motion. Okay. I had some activity on this side of the table, Ms. Voce. Okay, then I can support that <clears throat> if we will then accept it in total and it would be implemented with this year's scores for next year's release. So it's not retroactive, but we would approve the policy. That is the way that it's on the floor as of now. Okay, well then I would be in it's support of the substitute motion. No. 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 I, give me a second. Yeah. Right, Ms. Edmondson, do you have a question? Yeah, oh, she's just talking to the superintendent on the side. Yes, Dr. Jones. I want to be sure I understand. If I support the, the, the motion on the table, we have, in fact, passed this thing other than the, the, the uh, emergency rule piece of it. So it is now new, it is now policy if I support this motion. It's policy. Not just you. It takes six members, but yes. yes. Well, it's, that's it's, what I'm saying. It's policy on notice of intent. Yeah. And by yeah. It still has to go through the notice of intent process. Right. Yeah. Right, but we're on we're as a board. If it passes, we're on record as as having adopted that. A new um, is it framework? Is that the word we're using for alternative schools? No, no. Okay. Okay. Yes, Ms. Orange Jones. Just want to clarify when we say the emergency rule, we are talking about the conversation we've been having for the last hour regarding end size, yeah. which is the language in the emergency. When we say emergency rule, what we're talking about is this, this proposal does not affect scores that will be coming out in November. That's what we're talking about with emergency That's not what rule. She's asking. I'm not asking. Right, that. so that would be, that would be the emergency rule. I'm going to let the superintendent speak. And the all emergency the rule would be stripped. Everything in the proposal would go out on notice of intent okay. for a public comment process. Okay. You know, we don't utilize that process as regularly unless there's comment. But if there's comment, and Which I know uh, Ms. McConduit and Ms. Otala would be free to make comment during that time, we'll you know, there, there could be different proposals discussed during that time. Okay. So I think this probably accomplishes much of what they were advocating for. And at the same time, to Dr. Jones's point, it does put the board on record as having endorsed the proposal that, that the working group developed. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. I feel good. I really wish the boys wouldn't have snuck out 30 minutes into this conversation because because they could have really seen some democracy in action here. No, Ms. Voce, I'm about to get a vote. Why I do know, you have to say I know, something? I know, I yes. just have a technical question that I, I just I can't help okay. myself. Okay, go ahead. Look on page 83 and ex explain this to me. Um, I just want to make sure I understand. On page 83 under 3503D, where it has school performance scores uh, starting with 2019-20. Does that mean this new accountability formula would be for this for the 18-19 school year and would be released then in November of 2019? Yes. So that 19-20 is that accurate or should it be 18-19? And if you tell me that's written that way, it's okay, I'm fine with it. I just want to clarify that that's what it means. We're looking to the staff, and they're not making eye contact with us. Ms. Bagayan, come to the mic. You know the rules. Because the chart then says beginning in 1819, it goes into effect the 90 percent, 10 percent, and such. Yet the intro says 1920. I just want to make sure I, I'm not I think it's, this it's just correct. because of the interest and opportunities issue, I think. But is that, is okay. that right? As long as we know, as long as yeah. I Yes, the, that the score that would be next November, which is 2019, would be based on this formula for the 1819 results. We're saying for the 1819 school year, for the schools that 
you know, transition okay. to the new process. That's next, fine. next year. Ms. Yeah. Bofi, then I'm fine with it. Well, okay. Yes. Ms. Edmondson. I just want to clarify, and I want these ladies to understand and the general public, we are talking about the end size not being changed, being 10, correct? No, no ma'am. No. The, the, the proposal is to, uh, is for the board, if, if endorsed, okay. the board would say that it moves from schools to 30, doesn't change subgroups. Okay. Uh, but that is on notice of intent. And Ms. McConduit had suggested that there are other ideas and that this opens up a public pro comment process where those ideas could be advanced. So the that? key there, the key there is in size for our schools and in size for subgroup would be different. That's right. 30 the and 10. In size for the subgroup stays 10. The in size for the school moves to 30. But the 10 w will be in essence having an SPS score because they're The 10 is still in still, effect. Yes. If you if you get to 10 in a subgroup in a you school, get a you, you get, get a score, you get information and you get it triggers information. You just get information. Get interventions either yes. or the other. Yes. Okay. Y'all good clear with that? Yes, we cleared that, but I just want to add one more thing. That is out of order. <laughs> Ms. Edmondson, would you like to ask Ms. Atala a question? Yes. Okay, go I'll ahead ask and ask you. her your question. Yes. Okay, I'm confused <laughs> about the definition of alternative schools because I looked it up, I sent it to you, Ms. Edmondson. Our state says that alternative school definition is schools that work with behavior. Um, Dr. Jones referred to it as schools yeah, that true. have kids that's with significant true. cognitive. That's true. So we seem to be, we're not in agreement yeah. what the definition of alternative is. So can we get to the point that we define it, we agree on it, then we move forward before we start making all these changes? I think that's part of the need to get this bulletin done, is to begin to define these schools accurately. I think these schools, this does that. And I believe that it removes from consideration uh, of alternative schools schools that have historically exclusively served students with disabilities. Whatever one thinks of that type of environment, it removes those schools from being considered an alternative school. Which is what I think we need to do. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I think that's what our group and, yes. and everybody is in agreement with. I want to know if there's any objection to the motion on the table. Hearing none, motion passes. May What's I our next? A moment of, of personal privilege. <laughs> yes. I want, to, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank uh, our colleagues at the Ed Trust for coming and, and advocating yes. uh, and for, for the right reasons. But so, uh, as much as that, I want to uh, thank uh, Lisa French, Katie Barris, and Jill Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. um, this issue is a very, very, very complicated issue. And I think in their dealings with board members, in their dealings with communities, superintendents, they did an incredible job. And so I just want to thank them uh, for doing such great work. So thank you to those yes, three thank uh, staff. You. Thank you. Motion passes. What's our next item? Madam Chair, that concludes your agenda. The, the next, next meeting will start in five minutes. Wait.